You're watching the YouTube version of the We Are Innovation podcast. Join us as we explore how innovation, new technologies, and human creativity improve our lives. The future is calling. Welcome to an episode of the We Are Innovation podcast. I am your host, Federico Fernandez. Today, we're talking about fake news, disinformation, and social media regulation in Brazil. And for that, I am accompanied by our guest, Paula Ravakov. Paula is a Brazilian lawyer and holds a master's degree in public law from the University of Paris and an LLM degree from the University College London. She is a policy manager at Access Partnership, where she works at the intersection of law, public policy and technology working with companies to enable and optimize their participation in global markets and advising governments on how to best regulate existing and emerging market technologies. Online, you can find her at the website of Access Partnership. Paula, welcome to the We Are Innovation podcast. Uh, thank you very much, Federico. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. And let's, you know, to, to let's say, situate our, our conversation, why the topic of fake news has become so central in Brazilian politics and regulatory matters these days? What's going on there? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Good one to kick off our conversation. Um, to provide a more comprehensive answer, I think there's some issues to consider first. Um, so, Fake news is not new, right? It has always existed, and that's also the case in Brazil. So we have long-standing partisan divisions and the use of false information to attack political, uh, political rivals. So that's far from new. But we have digital tools such as social media and online bots and AI uh, mechanisms that have changed the speed that, at which this information travels. And because of that, it has amplified the extent to which uh, these fake news can manipulate public opinion. Um, but in an, in any way, you are you are very you're very right that the issue has become very central and topical in Brazilian politics these days. Without going into much details for why fake news have emerged and become such a massive challenge to Brazil's democracy, even elsewhere. What we saw is that during the whole last year, misinformation was promoted by high profile politicians and influencers targeting the country's presidential election that happened in October last year, so October, October 2022. And um, after the election, we saw Lula, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, uh, we called, call him Lula, <laughs> as a chosen candidate to run the country for the next four years. Um, we saw that social media was absolutely flooded by by posts, by videos, questioning the, the legitimacy of October's election process. And that's actually funny to say, to not say bizarre, but even though Bolsonaro was elected for 24 years through the same electronic voting system, so he was elected five times as a congressman and once as a president, he spent his entire first term just casting unfounded doubts about the digital ballot box. Um, but anyway, the discontent with the elections result by some far-right Bolsonaristas, that means the, how, we, how we call Bolsonaro supporters, plus this mistrust in our democratic process that was full by anti-democratic posts, uh, even promoted by Bolsonaro, culminated in buses, like busloads of people landing in the capital on Sunday, January 8th where they invaded and ransacked the country's Congress, Supreme Court, and presidential office. So I would say that these past events have shown uh, the current government and the population as a whole uh, that the potential of fake news to threaten democracy is, is real. And this has led policymakers at different levels, such as ministers, other government entities, in even our data protection agency, to be alive to these threats and seek ways of tackling it. So that's where we stand now, let's say. 
And are, are the, the social media platforms aware of the of this situation, particularly in Brazil? And are they, I mean, they are aware in the globe, but I mean, in Brazil, how are they reacting somehow? What's, you know, what's going on there? During all last year, we had all the, we heard, we read about it, uh, that all the lead, leading digital platforms have agreed with Brazilian courts and other uh, government agencies that deal with election to enforce tighter controls over the dissemination of disinformation. And they were reportedly working towards that. So I guess in Brazil, such as in other places where they, they had elections, so there were there was more more work was required. Uh, they have taken efforts to address online misinformation through different different means, let's say. So they work with outside fact checkers. So they just to try to figure out what is false from what is not. Um, this, they have placed um, like disclaimers on popular hashtags linked to to the to anything that in a way can attempt or provoke uh, violent messages. Let's say, and they have made commitments to remove content and accounts that supported national riot, riots. But um, as we, as I was saying, we had still this episode in, in January uh, this year, and it shows that this was not enough, right? So, violence in Brazil highlights the central role that social media uh, companies play in this um, in this issue. So, despite these efforts and this initiative to tackle misinformation, what Brazil might have understood is that they are they are only scratching the surface of of a a massive challenge. When uh, Saint Augustine, you know, the, the Catholic saint, you know, there's a, it, it's attributed to him that, that he, he once said something like, when nobody asked me what time is, I know the answer perfectly. When I when somebody asks me and I try to explain to this person what time actually is, it's very difficult for me to say. And in the same regard, I think the concept of fake news as well is something that, as you you know, on the surface it seems very clear, and we all understand it's apparently what they are. But I don't know if it's is is fake news are so easy to grasp. I think it's a problematic concept. And in, in by the way, in the in the very good article that you wrote for for Access Partnership, which I'm going to link in the in the description of the of the episode, you deal with this issue, and I think in a in a very interesting way. So what can you tell us about the, this problem? Yeah, I think it's a very very good question as well, and one that we should be asking ourselves because. Um, in my opinion, that's one of the biggest challenge because it involves, let's say, a philosophical aspect that comes with the intent of addressing the, the issue. I'll say that the first challenge here lies in formulating a univocal legal concept of fake news. Um, the term can comprise content that is illegal, such as expression of racism, and there, there's no doubt about this, that this content would be complete should be forbidden then you have content that is harmful and then you have content that is uh, misleading and that's what we call information and they are they are shared just with the sole purpose of misleading sometimes this content can be all of, all of these at the same time but sometimes and very often they are not and I think that's the second challenge I would say uh, because it concerns the, the content that is false but it's not necessarily legal because Freedom of expression uh, includes or should include the right to express incorrect views, right? Otherwise, it would be very, very difficult to um, to protect freedom of expression in, in, in the social, in the internet space. So the challenge, therefore, is not only to distinguish what is fake from what is true, but also to balance the right to freedom of speech and the need to control the impact of the information on our societies. And as you can imagine, the line regarding false content is extremely blurred. And that's that's the gray area that's very hard to regulate. So should we should it be illegal to share content that it's not racist, but it's just not true? 
and has the sole purpose of misleading? I Maybe yes, I think so. But there is an element there that is very subjective. So we have to judge not the act of sharing information that is not true, but the intent, the goal behind which that person is doing this. And this is because we understand, like I said, that freedom of expression should include the right to express incorrect views. So as you can see, this can be very challenging as it would be highly subjective and extremely difficult to judge, assess someone's intent. Um, another challenge relates to what we said before, which is a technical complication of deleting content. So we have had significant efforts uh, being made towards implementing AI tools, that delete specific type of content, uh, but the nuance of language often prevents these algorithms from actually grasping the underlying context of messages and actually understanding the, the subtleties or hidden meanings of, of, of any information shared. So just, for, just to bring an example, uh, in the case of Brazil, for instance, we had these online influencers who, who, who were denying the results of the country's presidential election. And, they were using a particular phrase to summon patriots, and that's how they call them, to what they call the Festa da, da Selma. And they did this like, by to, they tweaked the word Selva, which is a military term for war cry, and substituted the M for the, for the V in hopes to avoid the detection from Brazilian authorities. So instead of Selva became Selma. And Festa in Portuguese is the word for party. So very hard for a, for an AI-based tool to actually understand that they, what they were actually meaning. So this is it. Uh, AI helps and these, if this, uh, these uh, tools help, but it's still not enough. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, the other important issue here is that what, you know, <laughs> In a democracy, you are entitled to question the results of an election. You know, you are not entitled to initiate violence, you know, against a, an institution like the parliament or, you know, or someone else because of your doubts. But you are, I mean, and in Latin America, I would say all over the world, but in Latin America, we have examples of elections that have actually been stolen or that are questionable. So, and, and let's oh. say it would be a, a, a very bad uh, decision that you, you are, as a citizen, you are not able to express your opinion. Yeah, absolutely. You're completely right. He is in his right to, to, uh, to cast, I mean, not to cast out, but to say that he, he has doubts on the, on the election procedure. What he can't do is actually do the way he was doing casting doubt but not providing any sort of evidence of what he was saying uh, and that he was unable to unable to do he was asked several times to provide any sort of proof any sort of evidence and he he had none so either he stopped saying it or he provide some sort of evidence of what he he was claiming to be the truth indeed indeed paula and what what are the the, the the national institutions that deal with these issues? What what are they doing about? What what kind of initiatives are being discussed to, in principle, let's you know try to solve this problem? Um. So, like I said, this is really one of the main priorities for the current government and one of the their flagships, let's say. So there is a lot going on. Uh, we have some like older initiatives, the, like the one that was known was named Fake News Bill. Uh, the 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 actual the formal name is a different one, but it was proposed. It was a proposed legislation tabled in 2021, um, and includes measures that on, not only was aimed at reducing the dissemination of disinformation, but also provided new rules for the operation of search services, um, social networks, and messaging applications. And the bill was also restricting how digital platforms could use, uh, could share user data with commercial partners. And they also required some tech companies to publish reports. Um, I don't, can't remember exactly the cadence, but for each instance of content demo, demonetization and removal. So it was really quite, it is actually still being discussed. Um, it's really 
burdensome for, for those companies. And then more recently, we had uh, Luis Roberto Barroso, who is the minister of the Feder federal Supreme Court, uh, coming with an, a different proposal for the regulation of social networks and suggesting that there should be three levels of accountability on the networks. Um, then we also have the Minister of Justice, Flavio Gino, who uh, not long ago, maybe two weeks ago, argued that social ne networks are really threats to democracy and that should, should be regulated. And this comes after he presented a we call the anti-terrorist package, which included a bill to regulate social media and punish terrorist and anti-democratic content pub posted online. Um, and the law would hold social networks accountable. And they, if, it would force them to remove anti-democratic content without even the need for a court decision. A court decision. So um, these are these are some of the the initiatives, like. Uh, for to regulate, and then we we saw also that the president of the Supreme Superior Electoral Court, uh, Tessier in Brazil, uh, who his name is Alexandre de Moraes, he met with representatives of digital platforms, TikTok, Google, Meta, Twitter, um, among others, to discuss social media responsibility in the in the dissemination of fake news. Uh, so, as you see, there are a lot of initiatives. These are just to name a few, but there's a lot going on. There is, uh, there are certain issues, you know, that you mentioned that I would like to unpack, particularly uh, how's the coordination within the, the, the national institutions in Brazil regarding uh, this problem. But before that, you said a couple of, of, of words that are, let's say, very important and, 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 of course, you know, very dangerous to a certain extent, but can also be uh, used for, for, for very bad ends, which are terrorism, you know, fighting terrorism, fighting anti-democratic um, forces. Of course, you know, no, nobody is in favor of, I mean, very few people are in favor of terrorism or anti-democracy. But the problem is, and in this I would like to 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 know if you if you have some you have done some research about this, which are the other are there other experiences around the globe that you have identified of countries trying to tackle fake news, see in a in a you know in, in some sort of somewhat similarly to what's going on in Brazil right now. Because the examples that come to my come to my mind right now are probably not the best. I mean, not not the countries, not the best governments, and some of these attempts have literally meant the journalists, for instance, are in jail now, like in Turkey. So, and sorry, I'm I'm moving forward a little bit in your in your response, but um, definitely we terrorism should be fought. You know, nobody is in favor of terrorism. But these these tools can also be disfigured and move into ways that I'm sure we don't want to see neither in Brazil nor in the rest of the region. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's um, I think that's the fine line and the gray area that we were talking about. It's very easy to say that we're against terrorist content and uh, want to avoid curb this sort of information, but then it comes down to understanding what is terrorist and who's deciding what is terrorist. At content or not right um, but to answer your question I think I don't think any country has actually tackled fake news entirely uh, in my opinion it's still very much one of the biggest challenge of our century but we are seeing some developments in this field and some of them a bit more promising than the ones like in Turkey like you mentioned uh, if we think of the jurisdictions are usually like the trendsetters we think of the European Union and um in the EU, spreading false or misleading information is not generally illegal. So like we said before, freedom of expression in, I would say, all countries <laughs> includes the right to express incorrect views. But then we have the uh, Europe's DSA, so the Digital Service Acts, uh, that is trying to seek balance uh, between disinformation and protecting free speech. And... Um, the DSA forces large platforms to be more transparent and accountable for tackling disinformation. And it would shift away from self-regulation for like 
what we have today in relation to this information to a more hands-on approach, let's say. We still have to see how this will be enforced to understand if it's a model that can be followed. But it is one of the initiatives that is being, um, well, it has been already approved. So we have to, we have now to see how it will unfold and, and uh, will happen in like practical terms. That said, uh, we the lawmaker who actually proposed the fake news in Brazil have, has already mentioned that he sees the DSA, he highlighted the DSA as a reference to be taken into account in Brazil. So we might be seeing something similar to what we said, we saw with the enaction of the GDPR a um, couple of years ago. Um, I mean, more than now, it's 2018. Or, uh, with the, like an effect, it, we call it Brussels effect, right? They, they you really set the, the standards and, and the rules for a lot of countries. So let's see if that happens in Brazil as well. And speaking of Brazil, and coming back to to the article and something you mentioned that I think it, it it's it's worth that if we explore it a, a little bit, you suggest that there should be probably more coordination within institu national institutions in Brazil and, and and this issue. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think this is something I touched upon the article you mentioned as well. But it, this is something that is becoming actually quite obvious for, for anyone that is following the topic in Brazil. Uh, this is because, like I said, they have announced that regulation of digital platforms is a priority for the current government, but it's really not clear who will be in charge of creating or even enforcing those rules. And the number of and number and row of institutions dealing with the regulation of digital related issues is quite impressive now. So we have at least five different entities that could potentially deal with the issue. We have, um, so since as of January this year, we have a new department for digital policies that is placed under the presidency press office. We call it, call it, Brazil, we call it SECOM in Brazil, and it's the Brazil Social Communicate Secretariat. Then we have the Digital Rights Coordination Office, which is part of the Ministry of Justice, whose responsibility is to work with digital rights uh, in in general, evaluating the laws that already exist and, and uh, analyzing the need to adopt or create new laws to protect not only citizens' rights, but also to combat illegal speech. So it's very targeted at uh, combating or curbing fake news. Then we have the Secretary of Telecommunications that is placed under the Ministry of Communication, which, which is also responsible for proposing policies uh, related to the telecom industry and, and value chain, which could also include that, right? And then about two or three weeks ago, we had we saw the Minister of Human Rights, uh, Silvia Almeida, publishing um, in the publishing that the government has established an, an inter-ministerial working group to combat speech. Um, the, the group is composed of 29 people, includes representatives of so civil society, and uh, the group is set to last 180 days, if I'm not mistaken, and is actually tasked with advising the, the minister um, on the issue as well as carry out studies, strategies and proposed policies to combat this type of discourse. So it's a very welcome initiative, but a bit overlapping with all the other functions that we that I mentioned. And then we have also have the National Data Protection Authority, INPD in Brazil, uh, that has reported that they will set up a working group to analyze challenges related to digital platforms. And from what we understand, this includes uh, initiatives or proposals to, to curb fake news. And then we have the telecom regulator, Anatel, uh, wanting to have a say on the matter and actually wanting to be the body overseeing and enforcing these laws. So, so as you see, we have a lot of people interested in the topic and we need uh, coordination to, to make sure that is, yeah, we don't have overlapping though. We, we find the right synergies and, and our, we are walking towards um, the same, I mean, constructive and uh, inclusive um, discussion. Paula, 
Uh, if all these institutions that you just mentioned, and I wouldn't be able to repeat all the names because, you know, you literally have to study them for a, for a while because it's a lot. But if all of these guys would call you and, you know, would like to have a chat with you and would like to know your suggestions for this issue. And I know it's a difficult issue, but I would really like to know what, what, what would you, how, how how would you go regarding this issue? What what would be your your ideas to to deal with this information? Of course, balancing the the, the, the very important civil right that is freedom of speech. What would you say? I think that although there is no one singular right answer here, there could be different approaches that could work in different countries depending on. Um, depending on the country we are talking about. I think the way forward in Brazil, at least, is to understand that while most of the bills that has already been proposed or are trying to or are being proposed in the, in the next uh, in the next month, they might stem from a very legitimate desire to to curb the harmful car, curb this uh, disinformation and, and counter the harmful effect of fake news, but rushing legislative approaches proposes to regulate an issue that is so complex might not be might not effectively address all the challenges that we have at stake. So, in my view, in Brazil at least, where the discussion is still, I mean, there we have a lot of initiatives going on, but the discussion as a as a social, social, as a discussion from that belongs to society is still quite new and quite nascent. So, what we need is a really uh, an open, multi-stakeholder dialogue that brings together all all players, really, like the media, private sector, civil society, academia, and individuals to define goals, concepts, and and key underlying principles. So, like I said, the the working group that has been set up by by the Minister of uh, Human Rights is, is a welcome initiative, and I think that's what he's trying to do here. So I tend to say that effective regulation really cannot exist before a broad consultation with all these actors um, to define key aspects, such as first what the problem is, right? Because um, we, as we saw, as it's not easy to define who should be in charge of creating and enforcing rules. So, like I said. We need um, some sort of consistency and some sort of coordination among all the all these entities that are looking and trying to, to have a say on the matter. Uh, what entity should be regulated and what type of content should fall within the scope of such regulation? So these are very basic questions that we need to answer before proposing a regulation and still that's not obvious. So I would say that we have to start from there. <laughs> And again, thank you very much for your time. It's been uh, great uh, talking to you about these issues. Before I let you go, just a, a final question from from a scale, of, uh, you know, from uh, from one to ten. How worried are you that maybe the the Brazilian government will rush into legislate this problem without taking into consideration everything you just mentioned? Um to be frank, I'm not too concerned. I would say Brazil is a big country. A lot of people have their eyes uh, into it, right? Uh, so even though there might be some initiatives and some actors trying to rush the, the discussion, we have um, a big, um, a large pool of, of civil entities that are part of this are part of this this discussion of this debate and not and have the influence and will not let this happen um, we also have like i said already some initiative trying to uh, bring together all these stakeholders and from what i see this shows already an intent or an intention in in making sure that everyone their interests different interests are being heard and taken um, taken into account so i remain hopeful i don't know exactly what the, answer, the ultimate answer is what the, like um what is the op optimal regulation regulatory model would look like but um i remain hopeful in that at least the process to 
to propose those rules will be inclusive and transparent. Uh, but call me again in a, in a couple of years or a couple of some months and, and then I might just say that I, I was wrong. We'll see and definitely I hope we can talk again soon about, you know, hopefully, you know, other subjects, <laughs> more positive subjects, even though this is an interesting development, but it it has dangerous, you know, uh, uh, outcomes possible. Let's hope that they don't they don't happen. In any case, to everyone who has listened to this episode, don't forget to uh, to subscribe in any platform that you use to listen to podcasts. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll meet again in another episode of the We Are Innovation podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of the We Are Innovation podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite platform. To know more about We Are Innovation, visit weareinnovation.global.